Hello and welcome. My name is Professor Killian Ryan. I'm Pro Vice Chancellor International and Head of the College of Business Law and Social Sciences, in which our politics and some of our IR sits. So, on behalf of the university, you're all very welcome here today. When, uh, when I told my, my slightly grown up children that I was opening this session on Brexit Explained, first thing this morning they said, Well, that will be a short session then. So, uh, uh, the university is celebrating its 175th academic year. So our founding college was, uh, was founded 143 years ago out of another European crisis. So back then, the government was concerned in particular about the advances that the French and the Germans were making in terms of design and technology. And they founded four government schools of design around the country, one of them being here in Nottingham. So the our founding college was the Nottingham Government School of Design. And the mission was back then to, first of all, have less complex designs. A lot of the, the lace work which was being developed in Nottingham was far too complex for machinery. And on the other side, to develop machines that could handle more complex designs. So both technological solutions and design solutions to make us more competitive with the Europeans. So there is a... a not a Brexit connection, at least a, a strong European connection to our, to our foundations. You're also very welcome to the University of the Year. You would expect me to say that. And uh, it's, I have a pleasure of saying it in three years in a row in different contexts. We were the, announced as the Guardian University of the Year last Wednesday. And the rationale for that is down to the work that we do in terms of providing life chances for people from disadvantaged backgrounds. So, 25% of our students come from low-income backgrounds with a family income of less than 15,000. And yet, our graduate employability rate bears comparison with some of the best universities in the country. And in particular, we have managed to eliminate the gap between different attainment groups. So whether you're from BME or from different social classes, you have the same chance of getting a, a graduate job, a good graduate job, as people coming from more privileged backgrounds. So that's an enormous achievement uh, by my, my colleagues, many of whom are here today, and I congratulate them for the great work they've done on that. So I hope you'll have a stimulating debate on, on the, the issue this morning. <coughs> uh, I've got the joy of going off to an executive board meeting. I'd love to stay and, and, and listen to the pearls of wisdom. And maybe I could uh, learn, learn an explanation for this. As an economist, like my faith in rationality of humanity has all but disappeared. Uh, whatever our possibility of explaining Long the crash ago. of 2007, um, <laughs> Brexit uh, escapes me entirely. And my father, who's just recently died, has been saying to me for the last couple of years, I told you so, Killian. So there you are. He was a politician. OK, I'll hand you over to Michael now. I hope you have a good day and a good conference. Well, good morning and welcome to this opening session of the PSA conference. Explaining Brexit, known and unanticipated consequences just about covers the remit for today's round table. Um, we've invited a panel of people from different walks of life, uh, a distinguished politician, academics, and people who work for what I would call the think tank ocracy. And between them, I hope that we will make some sense of what has been happening to the United Kingdom over the last two and a half years. First of all, let me just say a little bit about the format. This is a round table. It isn't obviously a presentation of formal papers. I've invited our guests to briefly introduce a topic which I have indicated beforehand. There is some overlap between the topics, but there is a degree of difference between them uh, which merits their individual presence here. I think my first task is to introduce and, of course, to welcome our panel of speakers in the order in which they will make their presentations. First of all, Professor Robert Ford is Professor of Political Science at the University of Manchester. As you probably know, he's researched and written widely on the broad area of public opinion, electoral choice, and party politics. I don't think that the Right Honourable Ken Clark needs any introduction, but nevertheless, just to iterate his distinguished career in politics, he's held high, offi high office as Chancellor of the Exchequer, Home Secretary, Secretary of State for Education and Science, and so on. I could go on. He's currently, of course, Father of the House of Commons. 
Jill Rutter, who many of you will be familiar with from her regular uh, appearances on television over recent uh, months, is uh, the person who directs the Institute for Government's work on better policymaking and Brexit. She is a former senior civil servant. She worked for Her Majesty's Treasury. She's worked in number 10 and for the Department of the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. David Finnamore is Dean of Education in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences and Professor of European Politics at Queen's University Belfast and is also a visiting professor at the College of Europe in Bruges. And last but not least, Roland Freudenstein was a member of the Foreign Security Planning Staff of the European Commission in the 1990s. He's worked for the distinguished Conrad Adenauer Foundation and latterly, he has been head of research and deputy director of the Wilfred Martins Center for European Studies, which is located, as I'm sure many of you know, in Brussels. I thought it would be useful, you know, before we ask our speakers to make their comments to sort of contextualize this workshop. When the roundtable event was first discussed, the United Kingdom was, by today's date, supposed to be no longer a member of the European Union. But in the interim, we have been granted three extensions of Article 50 and probably counting. This is a situation that brings to mind the film The Never-Ending Story, which, as some of you will know, is a West German fantasy film based on a novel of the same name by Michael Ender. It's about a boy who reads a magic book that tells a story of a young warrior whose task is to stop a dark force called the Nothing, from engulfing a mythical world. If that isn't a good metaphor for Brexit, I don't know what is. Certainly Brexit is an historic process, and this conference could hardly ignore the program as the, that category, the catalog of events indicates. There are, of course, thematic panels to come on Brexit, but we thought it would be timely at the outset to debate some of Brexit's more generic aspects a review of what, to borrow a phrase, might be described as known knowns and likely consequences for the body politic. Rising political volatility, corrosive public mistrust in politics, widespread cultural anxiety, and all sorts of concerns about the effectiveness and functionality of the machinery of government. As I say, we've invited a distinguished guest list to address those broad questions. Crisis, of course, is a much overused word by the commentariat, but the word crisis is surely appropriate for Brexit in view of recent events. By reducing an immensely complicated question to a simplistic binary choice, our departed Prime Minister might have better heeded the warning of Ernest Bevan, a former British Foreign Secretary from a previous and probably more heroic age who observed that when one opens a Pandora's box, one never knows what Trojan horses might jump out. Sadly, that prescient warning went unheeded. The Pandora's box is well and truly open, and what I thought would be useful was to bring together some distinguished commentators to talk about what that Pandora's box actually consists of and what sort of problems have leapt out over the past two and a half years. Our first speaker, um, Robert Ford, has been asked to talk about what I call the state of contemporary politics and political culture. This concern with, if you like, the cultural aspects of Brexit was prompted by my rereading of George Dangerfield's famous book, The Strange Death of Liberal England. Of course, that book was not political science as we know it, but it was good forensic narrative history. And it relates not just the demise of a great political party, but the shift in the underlying cultural fabric that brought about a mix of contingent events, happenstance, and deeper structural changes that in a way mirror the experience of Brexit. Peter Mayer, of course, the late lamented Peter Mayer, referred to some of the cultural consequences of political change even before Brexit was enacted. 
He talked in his last book about the widening void at the center of democratic politics, the gradual evacuation of the public square, the disconnection between political parties and their electorates, a void that he said had been filled by rising mistrust and insurgent populism, of which Brexit is only one notable manifestation. And this, of course, is a phenomena, as Mayor quite rightly points out, which is not only appropriate to the United Kingdom, but to the rest of Europe as well. We don't have time to do a comparative politics of Europe, but the demise of established parties in France, the rise of far-right and populist parties into government in Italy, the declining fortunes of the German SPD, and more recently, of course, with the Israeli election, the incredible decline of the Israeli Labour Party. So the questions that I asked Rob to think about was how the referendum, its rancorous tone, its raucous discourse, is a symptom of deeper disconcertion in the body politic. What do these events say about the changing culture of British politics, the deterioration in the quality and tone of political discourse, both within the House of Commons and beyond it? And what does this mean for the future of stable politics and civic tolerance as the normative ballast of the liberal politics we have been so used to since 1945? Are we remotely yet at breaking point? Almost certainly not. Nevertheless, there is much talk of civil unrest if there is a second or confirmatory referendum. Ruth Fox of the Hansard Society has reported a growing preference for strong leaders, even amongst Remain voters. 54% of respondents in a recent survey preferred strong leadership and political discipline to conventional political discourse. So the question I think for Rob is, can normal politics, civility and civic discourse survive this raucous interlude? And what are the prospects for a return to political normalcy? Over to you, Rob. Uh, yeah, of course you can. Yeah. Uh, morning, everyone. So uh, my, my task is to uh, explain the uh, deep shifts in social structure and political culture that have led to Brexit and what the consequences of it might be for culture going forward and politics going forward. And I have 10 minutes, so easy peasy. <laughs> yes, but uh, ten, 10 minutes to at least lay out the case, which means I am going to uh, paint with a fairly broad brush uh, in laying out uh, some initial thoughts on this. I certainly think it's a mistake to treat Brexit as a kind of isolated uh, incident. You need to look at the events that led up to it and the structural changes that led up to it going a fair while back. So I want to start with that. Um, the very broadest summary of what I think is going on and has been going on for a while is that questions concerning us versus them and who we are are gradually interfering with uh, and cross-cutting the traditional questions of who gets what and resources uh, that have long uh, defined British politics. Brexit is one expression of that, but it's far from the only one. And the reason that those questions of us versus them and who we are have become more salient and more divisive uh, is down to two things. Uh, it's down firstly to a very long run process of demographic change, and in my view in particular two developments, uh, that all of us in the university sector are prospering, and so the share of the electorate who have attended university has risen very sharply in the past few decades and will continue uh, to do so. Um, when Tony Blair was first elected in 1997, uh, the number of voters in the electorate who had no formal educational qualifications at all uh, outnumbered university graduates by a ratio of three to one. Uh, at the last general election, for the first time in British history, university graduates outnumbered those with no educational qualifications at all. Uh, in the same period, the share of the electorate that has uh, an ethnic minority background uh, roughly tripled uh, and now stands at uh, uh, well over 10%, uh, probably mid-teens in most of England. Uh, now, those developments wouldn't be relevant uh, but for two things. Firstly, university graduates and ethnic minorities have profoundly different views on a range of issues that fall into the category of who we are 
and us versus them. And secondly, those issues have become a great deal more salient in our political debate. And that story can best be summarized and illustrated with the issue of immigration. Uh, so again, when Tony Blair was elected in 1997, immigration wasn't really on the agenda at all and hadn't been uh, for the best part of a generation. Uh, by the time he uh, won re-election, the share of voters saying it was the most important issue rose above 10%. It's been above 10% ever since. So 18 years now, continuously, with a large section of the electorate saying immigration is an important problem. And that section of the electorate tends to come very strongly from what I would call the identity conservative, ethnocentric, nationalist end of the population, particularly white voters with very low levels of formal educational qualifications. And incidentally, we need a term for that that doesn't imply stupid, because uh, I try and discuss these kind of divides on Twitter all the time, and people will respond to me saying, do you mean I'm stupid then? Uh, no, actually, I don't. I, I mean that your worldview, which tends to emphasize continuity and stability and, co and community, happens to tally up quite strongly with the education experience you've had. It doesn't imply anything at all uh, about whether you're intelligent or not. It's about your values. Uh, and immigration divided people by those values. Uh, white, uh, white voters with uh, low formal education levels, identity conservatives as I call them, um, saw it as threatening. Uh, and saw it as threatening in terms of its effect upon the national culture, upon national identity and so on. It never was, in my view, really uh, an argument that was primarily driven uh, by economics. Uh, but its emergence onto the agenda mobilized these kind of us versus them questions into politics. Incidentally, that's not the first time that's happened. In the election where my honorable colleague to my right was first elected in 1970, immigration also featured very heavily. Uh, much of the evidence we have suggests that a substantial segment of exactly the same part of the electorate, uh, socially conservative white working class voters, went over to the Conservative Party in part because they sympathized very strongly uh, with what Enoch Powell was saying about immigration at the time. So we've seen this kind of disruption before. What's different now is that you have both sides of the argument representing a big chunk of the electorate. So you've got liberal voters, university graduates, ethnic minorities, who view immigration very differently. Now, that was an issue already in the 2000s. It became an even bigger issue in the 2010s because of two things. Firstly, um, the conservative, incoming conservative government made a rash pledge to control immigration and bring it down to the tens of thousands, which was impossible to deliver while continuing to be a member of the European Union. And secondly, a party emerged who pointed out that it was impossible to deliver control of immigration whilst remembering, remaining a member of the European Union, namely uh, UKIP. So this then resulted in a large section of the identity conservative, white working class electorate, white low, uh, low education level electorate going over uh, to UKIP, disrupting the existing party alignments, which in turn led to the pledge of a referendum. And then in 2016, a leave campaign, which very much doubled down on these themes of us versus them. Take back control is basically a shorthand for we want to take back control from them. And the two sub-themes therein were control over immigration. Why should we have to accept them coming here without us controlling it? And sovereignty. Why should we have to accept the decisions they make about us? They were both us versus them questions. The Remain campaign, I think two of the th major weaknesses of it were firstly that it tried to make the argument over the European Union about the traditional questions of resources, who gets what. It's economically in our interests to remain there. But that wasn't the framing on which people were understanding the argument. The second problem they had was that before the EU referendum, there simply wasn't a large section of the British electorate who saw the EU as us. So the them arguments had a big advantage. The contrast actually is quite uh, uh, stark with Scotland where one of the reasons the independence referendum failed is that there's a big section of the Scottish electorate who see of Britain as us, England as us. More than 10% of the electorate in the Scottish independence referendum grew up in England. So in that us versus them framing, there was a powerful us pushing back the other way. There wasn't in the EU referendum. So then that brings us to where we've been in the past few years. 
And the first important consequence, I think, of the EU referendum was it forged two new, very powerful and very widely held political identities, partisan identities. In doing so, it created a new form of us versus them argument, where the us is remain or leave, and the them is the other side of that argument. Something like 70 or 80% of the population express now an attachment to these kinds of identities. And that's important because all the biases that we know of in partisan social psychology kick in. You see the other side in terms of stereotypes. You remember the pieces of news that fit your side and your argument. You see the contest, not in terms of compromise, but in terms of defeating your enemies. So part of the problem we have now is that a new kind of tribalism has emerged, a new kind of us versus them. And we saw that very clearly in the 2017 election. And uh, I'll, I'll give you two examples of how resource politics, who gets what politics, were displaced by us versus them in the 2017 election. The first is, when you run the numbers on which seats swung most to the Conservatives, the seats that swung most to the Conservatives in 2017, and this was very much a break with the pattern of 2015, were the seats where income had fallen most on average, where austerity budget cuts had hit hardest on average because the voters in those seats were not thinking of the election as being about who gets what. They were thinking of the election in terms of a Brexit leave us versus a remain them. And that, that led them to the Conservative Party. But at the other end of the income and wealth spectrum, we saw Canterbury fail to elect a Conservative MP for the first time since William Gladstone was Prime Minister. We saw Kensington elect a Labour MP in a seat which has some of the highest house prices and the biggest concentrations of wealth in the country. And that was because people at the other end of the income spectrum were also no longer seeing the choice primarily as being about who gets what. They were seeing it in terms of a remain us against a threatening hard Brexit them. And that was leading them to vote for a party whose interests were not necessarily aligned with their economic interests in much larger numbers than they had done before. And that led us to the scenario we have now where Parliament is very fragmented and where both parties are deeply cross-pressured between MPs and factions and activists whose primary interest in politics is still defined by the questions that have always defined our politics, questions of class and state versus market and redistribution and social justice and public services. And these new activists and interests that are defined much more by questions of us versus them. And it's very difficult to see how it gets resolved. Uh, I think we're in for a lengthy period of turbulence for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, both of the major parties are very deeply split by this question in ways that will be very hard to resolve. But on the other hand, it's very, very hard in our system for new parties to get off the ground. Um, now, I was encouraged not to go comparative. I mean, there's enough to cover in 10 minutes as it is. But if we look at many European countries where you see similar patterns of cross-cutting divide happening, uh, you see proportional systems accommodating that by systems moving increasingly from two or three parties to four or six or seven parties, so that the different flavors and ranking of priorities can be represented. You can have a nationalist, socially conservative party. You can have an anti-immigration party. You can have a liberal pro-EU party. We can't do that. We're forced to accommodate those divides within large, broad-based parties, but that becomes increasingly difficult because one of the features of us versus them politics is that it's not transactional in the way who gets what politics is. So it's very hard to get these new divides accommodated because as we've seen repeatedly in the Brexit debate, the people who are committed to a view of us versus them do not want to compromise with people they see as their enemies, do not want to meet people halfway when meeting halfway is letting them win. And I don't see quite how we get out of that. It's going to be very difficult. And even if we resolve the specific questions of Brexit, I don't think this will be the end of these kinds of divides because they are rooted 
in these much deeper social identity divisions. We have probably a generation or more to come where there will be two segments of the electorate, socially conservative, identity conservative, communitarian, white working class voters and university graduates and ethnic minorities, both of which are too large for any party with aspirations to government to ignore, but both of which have profoundly different views about a set of issues that are going to remain at the top of the agenda. And given how first past the post operates, that's going to make our politics extremely unstable. We already saw in 2010 to 13 a party that had barely ever sort of featured on the agenda rise to the highest poll ratings any new party had received since the era of the decline and fall of liberal England in the form of UKIP. Then in two years after the 2015 election, they more or less completely departed the scene. Uh, We saw the largest ever swing in a Scottish election in 2015 and the second largest ever swing in a Scottish election in 2017. This is, I think, the path of the future when we have a situation of two profoundly cross-cutting divisions being forced to be accommodated within a first-past-the-post electoral system. So I think Brexit isn't really going to be the end of this kind of division uh, and instability. I think it's going to be the beginning. Our second speaker, um, our second speaker has been asked to talk about something that he's experienced at first hand over recent weeks and months: dysfunctional party politics and, uh, in a sense, a discredited parliamentary government. Another notable challenge to orderly politics is the impact of Brexit on the way parties are behaving in the House of Commons. The norms, conventions, and procedures of parliamentary politics and a fully functioning party system, I think, have been uh, very much in the forefront of recent events. All of us who have witnessed those parliamentary events have been surprised, I think, even in terms of past standards by what has gone on in the House of Commons. Anne Widdicombe recently observed that we have got the worst Prime Minister since Anthony Eden, the worst leader of the opposition ever, and the worst Parliament since Cromwell. Is that fair comment? Is the constitutional fabric unravelling or merely in abeyance until normal order is restored? I said to Ken Clark when we were having coffee this morning that those of us who teach British politics will certainly have to rewrite our lectures and probably even rewrite our textbooks. We've witnessed all sorts of ruptures with the conventional conduct of government in the United Kingdom. Parliament usurping the role of the executive imposing unprecedented limits on executive discretion, occasionally abetted by Mr. Speaker. The subverting of customary hierarchic executive legislative relations. The erosion of ministerial discipline and not least of collective cabinet responsibility. A prime minister in office but hardly in power, unable to rely on her own party or cabinet and latterly resorting to negotiating with the official opposition to pass her landmark legislation. The point that Rob's been talking about just now, the internal fracturing of the principal party coalitions that threaten to unravel the whole system of constitutional government that I read about and was taught about by doyens of the profession like Tony Birch, Dennis Kavanagh and Sammy Finer. A two-party system, as Rob says, that no longer accommodates or represents the social cleavages and cultural fault lines that define the contemporary electorate. And of course, with that, the emergence informally of new alignments and cross-party arrangements that may have about them something of the reordering of party politics that Rob referred to. So I'd like Ken Clark maybe to address those questions of his own experience of the recent turbulence in the House of Commons, and whether or not he thinks that there is a way through this, and whether indeed this is merely abeyance, order to be restored in the not-too-distant future, or are we really at a new beginning? Okay, Ken. Okay, well, uh, surely. Uh, Firstly, I don't think you had uh, warned me that you want to be so specific about the parliamentary consequences now. I uh, I was going to address the more general subject, but you'll be relieved to know I won't. Uh, because 
Um, I actually have agreed with all the analysis we've had so far, and so uh, that's not being lazy or being polite to my neighbour, but I think uh, the bigger, we do have to put everything in the bigger consequence, uh, so bigger sort of uh, surroundings. I I'd only repeat two things which I strongly believe, which have already been said. Uh, firstly, what has happened is not unique to the UK. I think uh, the Trump election in America, hmm. the Gilets Jaunes in France, uh, the strange government that's emerged in Italy, and the emergence of populist right-wing, sometimes nationalist, sometimes racialist groups, even in unlikely places like the Scandinavian countries, are all part of the same thing. And uh, across the Western democratic world, the norms of politics which prevailed in those very stable countries in the 1980s and the 1990s have changed possibly irreversibly, probably irreversibly. Uh, I also don't think it's a totally new overnight phenomenon. It's been growing really since the millennium most, most, most rapidly, but I think it was accelerated by the financial crash of 2008-2009, which exacerbated the bitterness and disappointment of the left behind, uh, who's uh, the ordinary working man and woman whose income since has barely been raised and has probably fallen and not yet recovered in very many countries, particularly the States and here, and also exacerbated, as has already been said, by the rising trend of immigration, and uh, particularly by the surge in immigration in 2015. We, we were all taken by surprise by the remarkable phenomenon that the, the young living in countries mired in poverty, anarchy, and violence, but quite near to the more prosperous Northern Europe were no longer content to stay at home, but reacted to warfare and chaos by surging in unprecedented numbers uh, towards Western Europe. And it was probably an, a, one of many unfortunate coincidences that the referendum vote took place at a time when on the television one saw pictures of refugees on the beaches of Libya. And if you campaigned in the North or the North Midlands, I think everybody's experience was you found a remarkable number of people very affected by that. Immigration was high in their consciousness. If you tried to explain that the rights of someone to come here from the Middle East or Africa or wherever had nothing to do with our membership of the European Union, it merely confirmed to the person complaining that you were another lying politician from the establishment who didn't understand that we'd lost control and Brussels was obliging us to take these people. All views, of course, perfectly shocking, probably to the majority in a university and certainly to a liberal like myself who didn't share these views on refugees, uh, people who were black or brown, the Islamophobia, which was very widespread, nor the views on Europe, but it exacerbated what had been growing, I think, for a long time before. Turning to the specific, the parliamentary, the party system here, um, Europe was eventually the occasion of the breakdown of our very traditional two-party system, which, uh, but it wasn't sudden. It had always posed particular problems uh, for us. Uh, the, the, the politics which I was accustomed to for what's still the majority of my political career, was a very well settled system after the war. It was similar to other countries. A great centre-right block dominated the politics of competing with a great centre-left block and uh, taking it in turns, roughly, to take power. And when one side made a pig's ear, a swing of a minority of the population who were uncertain would put the other side in power. Our first past the post system imposed a very valuable discipline on our politicians and our public. You had two pre-packed coalitions. 
covering quite a wide range of views presented to the public uh, who would actually choose the one they liked or the one they disliked least uh, to give them the confidence of government. And it discouraged voting on single-issue politics. You couldn't really. The first-past-the-post system doomed, usually, single-issue parties from rising. That was the steady situation on the continent of Europe where proportional representation was more common then the coalitions were not pre-packed and were, but usually the same sort of coalitions would emerge in those countries that couldn't produce uh, an overall majority shortly after an election had produced the range of views. The United States was rather nearer to our system with these great uh, pre-packed blocks across the country, Republicans and Democrats. Now, going back to Britain and our experience, Europe always challenged that. Throughout my entire political career, because Euro the, the European project, of which I personally am a, because I'm centre right, I've been a lifelong supporter, the, the European project usually is supported by the, the centre of the centre right party and the centre of the centre left party. The, uh, and it's always usually opposed by the harder right, the more nationalist uh, uh, politicians, and by the harder left, the more socialist politicians, for differing reasons. But quite strong opposition is always roused, either for nationalist reasons or because it's too much based on free market rules, a capitalist club, to use the old phrase, and opposed by the left. Now, in the traditional British system, that immediately breaks both parties, and it always has, ever since the European issue was aroused. Uh, I was in Parliament in the 1970-74 election when we actually were joining the European community. One of the reasons I, as a centre-right guy, had joined the Conservative Party was in support of Macmillan's application to join. But when I find myself in the Whip's office in 1774 helping to get a majority for the European Communities Bill, it's the only piece of legislation that we had for the whole parliament, which was not a single party parliament bill, a single parliament government bill. The majority of conservatives voted for it, but about 50, quite an organized group, were strongly opposed to it. And their real leader was, was Enoch Powell, uh, typical of the patriotic nationalist right and the old imperialist wing of the party. And the only way the European Communities Act of 1972 got a majority was because of the support of uh, Roy Jenkins, Jenkinsite faction of the Labour Party. About 80 or 90 of them defying Michael Foote's uh, no, it wasn't Michael Foot then, but the, the, the left's opposition, the Labour Party's opposition to the, uh, uh, the, the, the European Union and giving us the majority required join. And ever since, throughout the almost 50 years of Britain being the United, in the European Union, uh, whenever uh, the issue has been raised, it has had the same divisive effect. The, the, the hardcore opponents of, uh, 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 in the 70s were Foot and Powell. Today, the hardcore opponents are people like Jacob Rees-Mogg, Boris on the one hand, and actually the Corbynistas on the other. Uh, and that uh, division, therefore, in itself challenged our politics. But our traditional party politics has been threatened by other things. Um, in, in the old days, there was a, a sort of tribal loyalty to one's party. The first elections I fought were uh, very, very much class-based, socially divided. Uh, bourgeois, middle-class England was largely conservative, with a small C, and voted for the Conservative Party. The Labour Party was always 
uh, was not very ideological. It was just in favor of order, competence, and uh, preserving the social structure, I suppose, to a certain extent. The Labour Party was always more divided, but it was the working class blue collar movement. Uh, very, very much, uh, it's very strong, cohesive societies supporting the labor movement, actually in alliance with and led by Hampstead liberals. Uh, and most people uh, automatically supported one or the other. If you canvass, families would tell you, we're all labor here, certainly if we're in a strong labor area, there was a, a stronger loyalty to the local football club which was expressed. Uh, and that was true in both directions. A swing of three or four percent from one party to the other was regarded as really quite significant and could lead to a shift of power. Now that has just collapsed uh, 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 over the years. And the social Democrats across Europe have a bigger problem than conservative Christian Democrats because the old blue collar, solid working class movement has vanished because technology has swept away that sort of social background. But nowadays, what's developed since is the celebrity culture, where personalities count more than most, and the selection of a government comes to resemble reality television uh, more than it ever has, what I call the, ooh, I do like that Boris Johnson vote, <laughs> uh, is uh, much more significant than it was in the time of Clement Attlee when I was following politics in my childhood. To get much of that. <laughs> <laughs> get much, it certainly comes up. With it. <laughs> uh, and it's, uh, you know, people are rather choosing the winner of the great bake-off uh -huh. uh, in the same way that they're choosing their potential mm -hmm. prime minister. Uh, but more, more, more importantly, uh, the much more media-based, public relations-based, constant short-term campaigning base that has crept into politics with increasing speed after the year 2000. Uh, and, uh, but the other thing I think that's uh, uh, that sort of moved uh, the public into the sort of state of affairs we've been described is the sheer pace of change, economic, technological change, and social change, which has steadily increased the number of people who feel unsettled and isolated. And going back to the analysis that's just been made, the big division that emerges, I think, in all the Western democracies is between the young, the educated, the successful, the entrepreneurial, the ambitious, for whom today's exciting world is just an endless opportunity to take advantage of new technology, ever more remarkable, whole new fields of economic activity taking place, ever more social opportunities. And the slightly more numerous, old, disappointed, can't cope with this, thought they had a job for life, which they were really rather proud of, find they've lost it, can't retrain for another. The, 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 uh, as has been brilliantly described by my neighbor, what I call the aged, disappointed, white working class of the North, the North Midlands, who played a key part in this, but they're joined by many people of my generation, Shah Tories, whom again, it's all changed too quickly. It's, it was so much better in my youth, it was so much easier. And I'll, I'll conclude with this. The, the trouble is what's emerging by way of a political reaction is they want people who will simplify it all. The damned politicians, it's all too complicated. They, people are attracted by politicians who have a simple analysis of the problem. It's all, it's all Mexicans, if you're an American. It's all les Arabes, if you're French. For English, it's all Brussels. Uh, and it's all the people in London. And, and you, 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 nice, simple analysis, simple solutions, and nostalgia. You're going back to a more secure and settled world, and this change isn't going to happen in the way that it did. And I think it was pure chance that the referendum 
brought all that out. There was never a public demand for a referendum on the European Union. The British public on the whole have never been very interested in the European Union, apart from the politically aware and those who follow these things. It's the, the, the public, uh, and I've never been particularly interested, the political class chose Europe and the circumstances chose Europe for this protest to erupt. But now it's out, it's going to be very difficult to put it back in the bottle. Now, one thing I haven't touched on is the mad events of the last uh, uh, few months. I will happily answer questions out if you like, but they're all over the newspapers for the kind of people in this audience who probably wish to follow that. I've been deeply immersed in trying to go back to what I think is what used to be regarded as the political skill of compromise. Mm. I've always thought the art of politics was trying to build as wide a body opinion as you could, working out what you want to do to make the world a better place, and then working out well, how much of that you actually might be able to deliver and, and what you're gonna to have to do to deliver it. Politics is two step forwards, one step backwards, uh, 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 and coming to terms of reality and coming to pragmatic solutions. Hence, somebody like me, probably the more, a more fanatic believer in the European project than anybody uh, in, active in British politics today, indulge myself by voting, by refusing to vote for a referendum, make it clear I'm not going to be bound by it, vote against Article 50, the majority against me is absolutely enormous, so I think the obvious way of getting back to some social cohesion and some sane political debate is to do a compromise, what I always call leave the political union, stay in the common market, uh, keep, have a permanent customs union, have a, a single market, no point in the modern world in putting barriers between ourselves and the biggest free trade area uh, in the world, uh, and uh, otherwise, see how we get on by uh, the more detached relationship with the rest of the EU. This is regarded as treachery by both sides, uh, blocked by vehement people's vote campaigners who are absolutely confident that a second referendum will be much better than the first one and will come to the right conclusion, and therefore they can't vote for anything that involves leaving, and of course, vehemently hated by the leavers, who are now much more hard line than when they were campaigning. The, the red lines did not exist at the time of campaigns. It was about stopping Turks coming here and saving our money to spend it on the health service. But now they've settled down to intra intractable positions. Well, we have to move from that, otherwise the, we'll, we'll see a burst of real protest voting if we have the European elections, we'll have a burst of real protest voting producing all kinds of fragmented groups, perhaps in the local government elections as well. Political normality we may return to, but not unless we address the deep social issues. So that's it. I agree that otherwise with the general analysis, the one thing I say of the general analysis, my last word, more and more consensus exists, not just amongst academics, many politicians about this theory of the left behind, the angry protest, the identity politics, breaking up the normal way in which our democracy thrives. I've yet to meet anybody who convinces me they know what the answer is in order to go back to a more sane, stable, uh, 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 and, and useful political system. I don't think we're ever going to go back in the world of social media to the kind of politics that dominated through most of my lifetime. We're in the middle of extraordinary events near collapse of our p political institutions. <coughs> in a few years' time, something will emerge, which I hope is more like good governance of the country. But I haven't yet met anybody who entirely confidently persuades me they know what style of politics, what organization, what campaigning is going to take us back to some sort of new normality. Thank you, Ken. We've talked about the impact of Brexit on political culture and the party system and parliament. A third theme of Brexit, of course, is the impact on the state machine. 
that sort of seamless relationship between uh, cabinet government and the statesman in disguise, the civil service, has been severely discombobulated or disrupted by recent events. Sir Simon Fraser, the uh, former permanent, permanent secretary at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, said recently that civil servants are being scapegoated for the errors and mistakes of ministers. Um, he implied that it was a mistake by the government to trigger Article 50 before trying to build some kind of coalition or making an outreach to the key stakeholders in government, in business, in politics, in order to work out a deliverable game plan for Brexit. Instead, he said they retreated behind entrenched red lines. Sir Ivan Richards, even more potent critic of the government, former UK perm rep in Brussels, has excoriated the government for what he called a failure to understand the complex interdependencies of contemporary international relations and political economy. Not least, he said, a complete lack of understanding in most people in government about how the European Union actually works. This, of course, chimes well with Donald Tusk's famous rebuke that there is a special place in hell reserved for those who advocated Brexit without any clear idea about what it meant in real terms. A former insider both at Number 10 and in Whitehall, uh, Jill Rutter, uh, will, I hope, now enlighten us about whether or not this dysfunctional relationship between the machinery of government and the civil service can be repaired, or is it really now in a situation of serious breakdown? Thank you, Jill. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Um, so, to build on uh, what uh, my former boss, Ken Clark, uh, was saying, I'm going to talk about uh, the London end of things, in particular the relationship between government, parliament and the civil service. Um, so as Michael said, I'm a former civil servant, I now work at the Institute for Government, and if you want more detail, because I think we've probably reached the stage at which the speaker barks down to six minutes now, um, we've got more in our report that we published on the 29th of March, which we've called, thought was going to be exit day, called the Brexit effect, and that gives you loads and loads of extraordinarily good data visualization. None by me, but we have really good people uh, at that at the Institute for Government, so we can present the data in very pretty ways. So I think it's really interesting to look and say um, what happened. If we look back two years ago to April 2017, we might have said it all seemed to be going relatively well. Um, the Conservative Party was relatively united behind the Prime Minister's Lancaster House mm. speech. Uh, the Article 50 bill had passed the Commons. Uh, I think it's one of the very interesting occasions when the Prime Minister has benefited enormously from the fact that Gina Miller forced her to bring legislation through in Parliament. The Article 50 bill had passed with a massive majority, uh, one notable Conservative rebel to my uh, right here, unusual position for him to be, <laughs> um, but a lot of Labour votes as well. Uh, Labour whipped in favour of triggering Article 50. Quite a few Labour rebels on the other side, but, uh, but uh, predominant Labour support. The letter had been sent off, slightly delayed because of Nicola Sturgeon uh, waiving uh, referendum two in Scotland. Uh, I think delayed the date from early March to late March. And the Prime Minister, of course, had her massive lead in the opinion polls, was about to go oh. on her fated walking holiday in Wales. So I think it's really interesting to look and see what has happened since. Why has Brexit proved so difficult? And to ask, and to ask but not answer the question, because um, I think answering it's probably more for the academics in the room, of is this an exception um, or is this something that is going to lead to enduring shifts? And I think across the various axes in which Brexit has affected the relationship between government uh, ministers, civil servants, and government and parliament, uh, the answers will be different in different areas. And we'll see a sort of shifting kaleidoscope until things resettle to a set of new relationships. So let's just talk briefly about why is Brexit proved so difficult for government to get its handle on. It's very difficult. Governments don't usually call referenda, they don't win. And of course, the government expected to win this referendum as in all others. You might blame that on David Cameron's over-casual view that he should be Prime Minister because he'd be good at it, <laughs> and you know, his sort of effortless superiority based on his backgrounds, etc. I'll leave that to uh, psychologists and sociologists to say. But what we do know is that the government did no real preparation 
for a Leave uh, victory. And interestingly, nor did the Leave side. Dominic Cummings made it absolutely clear that one of the key tactics of the Leave side was to be extremely imprecise about what leaving meant. Of course, that was great for victory because it meant you could piece together a coalition of people with very, very, very different views about what leave meant. But we are struggling two years on to resolve the question, if we are to leave, what did it mean? It meant we had a vote against something, membership of the European Union, but not a vote for anything. It meant that the sort of preparation that the civil service usually does when it's facing a change of government uh, could not happen. <coughs> what the civil service usually does in those circumstances is to become the big consumers and the big readers of manifestos. Uh, I think Ken Clark made some interesting comments about how familiar he was with the Conservative manifesto in 2017. Suffice to say, loads and loads of civil servants would have been reading that manifesto as well as the Labour manifesto to find out what their new masters might want. It was also quite interesting that because of the suspicion that people who knew about Europe were civil servants who knew about Europe would be committed to the European project, there was an, almost a decision that your qualification to work on Brexit within government after Theresa May became Prime Minister after the referendum was that you were the best available civil servant who knew very little about Europe. Uh, and that was almost the sort of defining thing for bringing people in. And of course, the other thing that Brexit exposed was the general 20 years on from the Good Friday Agreement, uh, 25 years on from the Downing Street Declaration, was how little understanding of what went on in Northern Ireland, mm. very much a different country, uh, how very much less understanding we had of Ireland had uh, penetrated into across Whitehall. So all that was then compounded when the Prime Minister lost her majority. So where was the civil service? The civil service is coming off the back of cuts since 2010. Those cuts have been significantly reversed. That's had some good effects. We've got lots and lots of new blood. In Whitehall, it's had some bad effects. We have a massive hemorrhaging of experience. But the thing that's really, really been difficult for people within government, for civil servants, has been the absence of decisions by ministers. The civil service is always accused of having its own agenda. The civil service, by and large, only has its own agenda when politicians aren't providing one for it. Mm. And people have been managing through <coughs> stasis in political decision-making caused by that deep fissure within the cabinet. But they've also had to plan for multiple scenarios. And even as we speak now, multiple scenarios are still in play. We don't know whether we'll be leaving in June, in October, whether we'll be leaving with deal or no deal. We don't know what our ultimate relationship with the EU will look like. We don't know whether that will kick in at the end of the first implementation period, still December, end of December 2020, or we'll have another two years. And that's massively difficult if you're planning, if you're managing, whatever. The timelines were always ludicrously short. If you look at the much more simple project of managing the Olympics, we had seven years to do that. That's a hugely easier task than doing Brexit. And as we said, there have been huge suspicions about the civil service. Actually, not uniform. A lot of ministers, even brexit -y ministers, have left government and paid tribute to the work of their civil servants. But there have been constant aspersions uh, Ivan Rogers, we know, resigned, flounced out with his famous speaking truth to power, email to staff. Ollie Robbins uh, has been uh, proffered up as the uh, dark uh, prince of Brexit, manipulating the prime minister, because, of course, women prime ministers can't know their own mind, so they have to be totally influenced by their male advisers. And once Nick Timothy went, Ollie Robbins sort of stepped into the breach, uh, asked him whether in his heart he believed in Brexit, uh, at a select committee. But I think some of that suspicion has actually been compounded. Uh, Michael mentioned Simon Fraser by the fact there's been a chorus left of former civil servants spelling out their own views that they think Brexit is a mad folly <laughs> and giving rise to deep suspicions in, not entirely in a helpful way. Uh, the George Osborne's co-option of the Treasury into Project Fear, I think, uh, one given people cause to look at the government economic analysis as possibly tainted and certainly given Brexiteers lots of reasons for suspicion. That's all been compounded by 
as I said, problems in decision-making cabinet and problems in legislation. One of the big problems for the civil service and for government has been this sheer difficulty of getting legislation through. Uh, not just Brexit legislation, other legislation too, but we've seen a war of attrition over the last two years between government and parliament. Bills have been introduced and then gone missing in action as government tries to avoid divisions. Uh, we've seen serial resignations, we've seen rebellions. Actually, interestingly, in parliament, most of the rebellions uh, came from Remainers, whereas most of the resignations until very recently from Cabinet came from Leavers. We've seen a government willing to rip up parliamentary convention, but we've also seen a speaker willing to rip up parliamentary convention. Mm. And what we've really seen is a big, and this is where I'm going to leave it, a big question mark over the normal understanding of Parliament. We've had a Big, big breakdown in collective responsibility. That's been one of the great big building blocks of our system that basically, unless you agree with government policy, you leave the cabinet and pose it from outside. The prime minister has had to more or less suspend collective responsibility, but in a rather odd and variable way, which means she's lost ministers sometimes and not other times. But we've also had that fundamental principle ripped up that a government that can't get its main legislation through doesn't command the confidence of the House and has to be replaced or at least face the test of the electorate in a general election. That's not happened either. The day after the Prime Minister went down to the biggest defeat in parliamentary history, she won a confidence vote and you could almost feel the sort of relief on the Conservative side at being able to vote as Conservatives again rather than having to oppose each other. We've had a breakdown in the parliamentary system in the whatever, effectively we now have parties within parties and it's rather remarkable when parties vote together. That's obviously been bigger on the Conservative side where the European Research Group has been described by people there as parties within parties. Looking forward, the big question for British government, for British politics is, is it just because Brexit is so odd? Is it just because Brexit came not from a manifesto but from a referendum and because it has split the country in a way? Or is it, as Rob said, that our park, parliament, our parties, our political system, our government is trying to get to grips with something that basically has changed the basis on which our political system operates? Thank you, Jill. It's curious, isn't it, how eventually everything comes down to Ireland? I think Churchill said after the First World War that after the tides of war had receded, there were still those forbidding grey spires of Ulster. The Irish question has dominated British politics since the Home Rule question in the 19th century, and in some ways it's still dominating British politics. The Irish border issue, of course, was very much part of the withdrawal agreement, or the negotiations over the withdrawal agreement. But it has spilled over into a more widespread debate about constitutional relations, whether or not there will be a border poll to reunite Ireland, what impact the contagion of the Irish debate might have on relations with that other difficult neighbour north of the border. There's no better person, I think, to address these questions of the significance of the Irish um, border issue than David Finnamore, who, of course, teaches Irish politics and is an expert on this issue uh, at the Queen's University in Belfast. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, first thing to, to say is, thanks for inviting me here. Um, you mentioned the Irish question, the Irish border. Perhaps we need to reframe it slightly. Mm -hmm. It's as much the issue of the British border on Ireland mm -hmm. as the Irish border. Mm -hmm. and I sometimes think when you view this whole Brexit process from the other island, it looks rather different mm -hmm. to what it does mm -hmm. here. Um, I want to say a number of, quest number of uh, points here. Looking back on the last three years of this process um, from Belfast, um, look at some of the various knowns that have come to the fore. Um, and these are knowns which I would say are known knowns on the island of Ireland mm. and also in Brussels, but at times appear to have been unknown knowns in much of UK government thinking and the political debate on this island. Um, a first is, most obviously, the border. Or to put it slightly different, the land border. Simple statement. But who in Westminster, in Whitehall, understands the economic, political, 
social implications of imposing a land border. A lot of the discourse in British politics is about borders that are sea borders, mm. that the border is at the airport. It doesn't divide people's daily lives. Mm. Mm. But when one thinks of the border in an Irish context, you think of the land border very, very differently. It affects people mm. directly on a daily basis. Moreover, you can't just talk about the border on Ireland. What you need to refer to is one of the most contested and politically significant borders in Western Europe. I think this has arguably been reflected um, in the whole process. I remember about a year ago, sitting down and suddenly realizing, although British and Irish officials and EU officials use exactly the same language, the border, they understand it very, very differently. We've had a debate over the last two years where I think a lot of the thinking in Westminster has based the understanding of a border on something which, or sees the border, something which is administrative. It's about tariffs. It's about the collection of duties. It's about where you impose controls. But for the vast majority of people on the island of the island, the border is about far more. It has social dimensions. It has constitutional dimensions. It has psychological dimensions. And it's taken a long time, I think, for the debate here in England, in Westminster, to really catch up with that. I think secondly, and the second observation is that Northern Ireland is a distinct part of the United Kingdom um, with particular constitutional status, with its own legal system, <coughs> with different symbols, different aspects of daily life which set it apart from the rest of the UK, with its own particular form of, at the moment, pretty dysfunctional devolution. But most importantly, what you have regarding Northern Ireland is the 1998. Years ago, very few people in Westminster talked about, very few politicians really understood, and which now has moved centre stage. Um, in a lot of the discussion around Northern Ireland and the implications of Brexit. We've had to come to terms with the reality of the Good Friday Agreement existing. Okay. Thirdly, and relatedly, um, the Good Friday Agreement exists not as the end point of the peace process, but very much at the beginning. And that peace process remains fragile. It's a peace process which over the last 20 years has pretty successfully taken the border out of politics on the island of Ireland. Brexit put the border back into politics, something which I don't think on this part of the UK. Um, consequently, Brexit, that was always going to be disrupted, it wouldn't take place, it wouldn't have been supportive, it wasn't going to be disrupted. disruptive has disrupted that peace process. Not that that means we're on the verge of a return to violence, but there is, in the manner in which Brexit has proceeded, and arguably the disregard at times for the implications for Northern Ireland and the island of Ireland, concerns about the commitment to that agreement and the peace process. Okay. There's arguably been a willful neglect at times of the potential implications of Brexit for the island of Ireland. Fourthly, I think this has all been compounded by a failure to listen to what people in Northern Ireland think. Now, I think you can just about, you can say the same for people in Scotland, say the same for people in Wales, but there is a perception, and I'd argue it's pretty close to the reality, that this whole process of Brexit has been driven by an Anglo-centric view of the United Kingdom. It's been driven from London. <coughs> Compounding the situation from a Northern Ireland perspective is that the Northern Ireland view that's represented in Westminster is a particularly unionist and a particular form of unionist perspective. Now, one can blame Sinn Féin for not taking their seats, but the reality is that the view in London is, um, uh, or the Northern Ireland dimension, is, is filtered through the, the, the lens of the, D, the DUP. Okay. Um, added to that, when we look at the way in which the UK government has responded to the challenges of Brexit, it's tended to take a very centralist 
perspective. There's not been the level of consultation with the devolved administrations that one would expect of a state that has gone through the process of devolution that we've seen over the last 20, 30 years. Okay. Um, and that has only led to um, dissatisfaction um, in Northern Ireland, in Scotland, and in Wales as well. Consequently, a lot of the debate has had what I would say um, has been uh, characterised by a high level of ignorance of the realities of what Brexit means in the constituent elements of the, of the UK beyond England, and particularly in Ireland, and particularly in, in Northern Ireland. This has also been compounded by the fact that when we look at the, the, the makeup of um, political parties represented in, in Westminster, the level of understanding and knowledge of Northern Ireland is low. That whole generation of individuals who was integral to the peace process um, and the establishment of peace in, in, in 1998 has essentially disappeared. So the knowledge of Northern Ireland has been pretty low. Okay. This situation um, has obviously, I think, put the UK government on the back foot in terms of dealing with how to address the challenges of Brexit for Northern Ireland and in the negotiations with the EU. Because in contrast to the British government's position, I'd argue that the EU position is one which is genuinely reflected far more the realities um, on the ground in Northern Ireland and the implications that Brexit will have for Northern Ireland, particularly if we do get the reimposition of a border. That is partly due to the position of Ireland, um, successfully lobbying, but I also think it reflects the fact that the, many people inside the EU understand more, going back to my initial point, what land borders are and what the implications are of reimposing them. They also understand the significance of European integration for borders and also the significance of European integration for peace processes. If we think about the way in which the Good Friday Agreement is often talked about in a UK context, it's as though it exists independent of European integration. But the Good Friday Agreement was adopted in the context of shared membership in the EU, and it was always assumed that the UK and Ireland would remain in the EU. Okay, two points on unintended consequences. Um, it should not surprise, as I said earlier, that Brexit would be disruptive. Um, but I think if we look at the Northern Ireland, Ireland, Ireland dimension to, to Brexit, it's been far more disruptive than anticipated and has raised many concerns indeed. First is that whereas right after the referendum in 2016, we actually had a broad convergence of opinion in Northern Ireland about the best way forward. We had, quite remarkably, in the August 2016, a letter from the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, which essentially argued for the status quo to be maintained. It talked about the movement of services, capital, goods. It talked about continued migration of people in and the value that um, short-term migration, at least, um, played for the economy in Northern Ireland. It talked about continued North-South cooperation, cross-border cooperation. It talked about continuing um, subsidies for agriculture, continuing um, market access. That, however, soon began to unravel. And unfortunately, we moved into a situation where positions on Brexit tended to correspond with traditional green and orange perspectives. And that in many respects, rather than being the issue which might have united some of the political parties in identifying a way forward, the manner in which the whole debate has proceeded has tended to exacerbate tensions. And the situation we have now is one where the nationalist and unionist parties tend to be looking in completely different directions. Um, added to that, those who sit in the middle more, the Green Party, the Alliance, are being seen to be part of a pan-nationalist alliance. So the sort of divisions which we've uh, traditionally dominated Northern Ireland politics have come to the fore. Um, and this actually makes it very difficult to think about um, a move back to um, uh, power sharing and the re-establishment of, of Stormont. On top of all this, particularly given the sense of neglect that I think is widespread amongst many nationalists, um, particularly over the commitment of the UK or British politics to, to the Good Friday Agreement. We've obviously seen increased debate about the desirability of Irish unification. Just a, as the peace process took the border out of, of politics, it certainly um, dampened the ardor of some for a united Ireland. Many people became content with the functioning of power sharing of the devolved administration, devolved institutions in Northern Ireland. We're not there anymore. 
we have increasing support for Irish unity emerging, we, although that falls well short of the 50% required in order for the Secretary of State to trigger a, a border poll. Increasing public opinion, public opinion increasingly indicates that the majority anticipate there being a border poll at some point in the foreseeable future. The border poll is just a question of time. Um, therefore, Brexit is, I'd argue, a threat to the Union, as a number of ministers have indicated. And quite ironically, given that Brexit is a threat, especially if poorly managed, the backstop, highly divisive, could actually be the means by saving the Union, at least as far as Northern Ireland's position is in the UK. We'll need to see in due course. Um, Brexit is a process, as I said, that's going to be disruptive. I think we see that evident in the way it's played out in Northern Ireland. Um, it's placed a spotlight on Northern Ireland, which at times is welcome, at other times not. It's forced questions about the border to be considered. It's arguably developed our understanding of the what a border, a land border means. And I think it's also got us to think a little bit more about Northern Ireland's position in the United Kingdom. In doing so, it has, however, raised questions about the nature of the UK, how it is structured and functions or not. Um, and if there is a silver lining to this process, we do better understand what the United Kingdom is. We know more about the Good Friday Agreement than we've known for a generation. Um, through the Northern Ireland dimension to Brexit. And arguably, we better appreciate some of the potential challenges that Brexit entails for the UK, assuming it continues to proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Dix. Last but not least, um... I'd like to invite Roland to talk about the European view of Brexit, the view from abroad. We've obsessed about Brexit. I mean, the whole bandwidth of British politics has been obsessed with the impact on the UK in all sorts of ways that we've discovered and described and discussed um, in this morning's presentations. Lord Hill, another former British permanent rep, wrote an article in the Times last week about the latest extension where he says that this should be used to actually not obsess about our future relations in terms of customs or tariffs, but our broader political and security relationship with the EU 27 states that we are divorcing from. Those sort of issues, I think, are ones which tend to not get the um, coverage that they deserve in the debate in the United Kingdom. Could I ask Roland maybe to address some of those issues in his presentation now? Michael, thank you so much. You guys here have used about 80 minutes covering two countries, UK and Ireland. <laughs> I'm supposed to cover the 26 <laughs> remaining ones uh, in five. Um, but thanks for having me anyway. Um, <laughs> you know, if I was British or American, I'd have to start this now with some kind of joke or entertaining anecdote. Thank God I'm German. Um, so all I can come up with um, is to relate to you a scene from yesterday's uh, German public television talk show, Sunday noon talk show Presseclub. And in Presseclub, um, four journalists were debating Brexit, of course, and, and the scene when uh, this panel broke into a totally un-German, unmitigated mirth was when one of them began describing Jacob Rees-Mogg and his uh, three-piece suits and the nasal accent and the parting of his hair, <laughs> which is razor sharp because his, the nanny of his kids does it every morning. At that moment, the moderator, again very un-Germanly, interrupted the speaker and said, and you see, this is why we hate Brexit, because we're going to lose that. Well, as if Jacob Rees-Mogg disappeared from this world. But um, now, just to give you the, 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 the mood, of course, culturally speaking, is, is one of mourning in Germany. Uh, politically speaking, Germany feels that we're losing an ally in terms of um, 
a more market liberal, less regulation oriented approach as compared to the southern members of the European Union, especially France, less uh, centralized approach than France. But there was a double miscalculation about Germany in the entire, in the original Brexit project, mm. which was that, uh, you know, basically Theresa May would travel to Berlin, talk to Angela Merkel, and Angela Merkel would, you know, consider the interests of the German car industry and uh, then clubber the other Europeans into submission and grant Britain the cherry picking. Um, that that the the 26 so so no 27 actually uh, so uh, voicefully rejected and surprisingly to to many in the Conservative Party, um, so double miscalculation that 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 somehow uh, 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 you know Merkel would be a pushover for the British government and the other Europeans would be a pushover for the Germans. None of this did happen. Actually, the 27 remained amazingly unified on two things. Uh, one, one is the, the, the importance of the four freedoms as a package deal, you know, the freedom of movement and then capital uh, 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 goods um, and services across the single market, so no cherry picking there. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the other one was, of course, the, uh, the question of the backstop and the Irish border. The, sorry, the British Irish border, um, <laughs> which, uh, which also, on which also initially uh, many people in London believed that uh, uh, the continent could be somehow divided along those lines. Uh, but I would say that at the moment, and we've seen this in the last European Council, uh, with, a, with a postponement until... Uh, uh, 31st of October, and of course the Halloween jokes are tumbling in Brussels, and uh, with a review moment in June. So that council, for the first for, for the first time, saw a fraying of the unity on the continent. France was the outlier uh, in that case. Openly, uh, I would say the picture the picture is a bit more complicated. It's not not just France versus the other uh, 26. Uh, but there are more complicated fault lines. I cannot go into this in detail here. Let me just say there's a couple of groups emerging here. Um, I've talked about Germany. Uh, as far as France is concerned, obviously France feels that on economic issues, on issues of the construction of the European project, uh, an antagonist is leaving with Brexit, and therefore that's basically good news. I mean, some champagne bottles were popping in Paris after the referendum. Uh, uh, but uh, in security terms, that is, uh, that's where France is actually smarting from, from Brexit and definitely preparing everything for a, uh, uh, first of all, to continue the strong bilateral relationship, France-Britain, uh, you know, the Saint-Malo declaration in 98 mm -hmm. and all this, uh, and continuing that for the time after Brexit, a bilateral defense cooperation, and on the other hand, to have, to have Britain strongly involved um, post-Brexit into all security questions, especially also anti-terrorism and, and, mm -hmm. and counterintelligence and so on. Um, so, so, so here's th this is where France is is, is advocating a close as, uh, a relationship as close as possible. Now, there's the so-called Hanseatic League 2.0. It's a Financial Times uh, invention to call it that. These are eight countries: um, the three Balts, the three Nordics, the Netherlands, and Ireland, which are fiscally relatively conservative. Um, uh, which are which are relatively intergovernmentalist. I mean, compared to let's say the the Club Med, which would be the counterfaction here. Uh, so so these are countries which represent some of what Britain used to stand for. And of course, now that Britain is leaving, they put their foot down, and they have actually done so most visibly a year ago in a letter of the eight finance ministers of these countries, which, uh, which basically uh, concerns the future of the Eurozone, again advocating fiscal prudence, advocating uh, a reduction of the EU budget, all these things that, you know, the more southern uh, or, say, French-led um, 
uh, people in the European Union uh, would reject. So um, that's the Hanseatic League. Then we've got the Visegrad group, and it, within the Visegrad group, especially Poland and Hungary, uh, which, are, which feel like, on the one hand, they're losing an ally when it comes to a more intergovernmentalist orientation, the European Integration Project, mm. On the other hand, are busily trying to develop, especially in the Polish case, a bilateral relationship, especially on security, especially on defense. Um, and uh, uh, Hungary now under Viktor Orban, busily using uh, uh, the Brexit as a point of accusation against the last European Commission, against any kind of federalizing tendencies in the European project. Uh, blaming, clearly blaming Jean-Claude Juncker for Brexit, uh, which is uh, taking it a bit far, I mm. must say, especially after mm. all we've heard on this panel before. Mm. Um, so, um, and about Ireland, we've talked about, I'm going to skip the, the other individual countries, but just to say that these fissures are emerging now. That doesn't mean that we have an official split or something. As you see, that the, the, the council members could agree on a policy uh, extending, extending the Article 50 deadline. Uh, but I would say that uh, there is more disunity now than ever before in the Brexit process. Mm. So, uh, just one word about this uh, postponement of Brexit. Obviously, the idea behind that council decision was uh, something that politi politicians usually are excellent at, which is called kicking the can down the road. In other words, trading possible future costs for a uh, staggering amount of, 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 of present costs that would arise in the case of a no-deal Brexit. Uh, and that's not just the 50 billion that Britain probably wouldn't pay into the EU budget um, in case of a no deal uh, Brexit and the, and the, the acrimony um, uh, that would arise certainly between, uh, between London and uh, Brussels and London and the uh, capitals on the continent, but also in terms of, uh, of course, uh, economic, uh, economic uh, uh, perspectives getting uh, diminished, uh, not only for Britain, but damage done also to continental economies uh, to quite some extent. Certainly, damage not being made up by the few business opportunities that would be gained, which also exist for countries. Countries like the Netherlands would certainly gain to some extent from financial services moving to the continent and so on, but the costs are immeasurably higher and therefore were estimated too high to be risked at this point in time. Uh, the costs in the long run, of course, or the, the immediate costs of after the European elections is that Britain will take part in the uh, European Parliament election and will, uh, will therefore bring in a uh, considerable potential for disruption. We've already had this in a Jacob Rees mock tweet. We're going to be as difficult as possible. I think that sums it up. Uh, the things that Brussels uh, especially is afraid of, uh, uh, with Britain taking part in these elections and sending, sending also a commissioner uh, and being present in the, in the EU Council. Now, just a last word about the long-term perspective. Obviously, uh, even though Britain never was in the Eurozone, but in terms of economic philosophy, in terms of the approach of government roles in the economy, uh, the club met philosophy on a more centralized approach uh, also inside the Eurozone gets strengthened simply by the fact that Britain, Britain is leaving. Um, uh, in security, France remains, uh, security and defense, France remains the only real power uh, inside the, the remaining EU, Germany is certainly not ponying up one of the huge disappointments for uh, both the, the security community in Berlin, but also Germany's partners in Europe, uh, is that so far there's no sign of Germany taking on its uh, military and defense responsibility after Brexit, uh, besides some nice talk. Um, and then, of course, the, of course, Europe is the European Union will not be the same anymore. It will be weakened diplomatically. Uh, there'll be more opportunities for powers like Russia and China to actually play Britain against the continent. Uh, and uh, you know, I think uh, President Trump would certainly also look for his opportunities to use to drive a wedge in, and, and use use possible acrimony between London and Brussels uh, for his project. Um, 
But all this being said, uh, it, 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 the, the, one of the most amazing effects of Brexit, of the Brexit referendum, and especially the Brexit shambles process since then, has been that the European Union became much more popular in public opinion mm. across the 27 countries. Mm. There's, a, there's a remarkable <laughs> upswing in trust in the European Union and its institutions, uh, which rounds, runs counter to the general loss of trust in politics. Uh, uh, and, and that certainly is due to not what is to, to, to the, the, the de facto deterrent example which the Brexit process has offered to populations uh, on the continent. Um, and so uh, to leave you with this, of course the EU is going to survive Brexit. I personally do not believe in Brexit reversal. Uh, I actually think the long-term costs would be even bigger uh, if, if Britain was to in some kind of form return to full membership. I'm not sure what uh, staying in the single market but leaving the political union would look like, as Ken Clark uh, proposed before. Uh, I can only say that in that case, of course, Britain would be a, a big taker of legislation. And of course, Britain would, accept, would have to accept the four freedoms, uh, including the freedom of movement, which, uh, which I do not see. I thought, I thought that this is precisely what Brexit was all about. But let's look for, let's, if, if, if not the current deal on the table, then let's look for another compromise deal. Uh, but um, leaving you with this, with this uh, only halfway optimistic perspective, thank you very much. Thank you, Rowan. We've got a few minutes left, and I don't know exactly what the timetable is, but I think that unless you've got other panels, we still have this room booked, you know, for the next half hour. So if our participants don't mind just staying behind a bit, maybe we could have, have some questions um, or some observations from the audience. We've got some roving microphones, I think, if anybody needs... Anybody has any questions? Yes, one, two, yep. Do you need a microphone? I probably don't, no. <laughs> okay, there is a microphone if you need one. Okay, please. Um, Could you just say, first of all, your, your name, your academic um, designation, and who the question's to? Yeah, so I'm Cherry Fowler, I'm a PhD student at the University of Manchester. Um, my question's probably slightly different to what you said Yeah, I, I agree. I think the last election producing this two-party result, I think, was a bit of a freak. Um, the, 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 uh, the, the, it, it actually was called at a time when the Liberal Democrats had a very damaged brand and weren't able to do very much. So, so they're reeling from the extraordinary reaction to student loans and going into coalition with the Conservatives and so on. And UKIP looked like a single issue uh, party that had just achieved a single issue. So it was now slightly irrelevant, particularly as Farage had vanished and wasn't campaigning. So the two parties got a huge share of the vote, biggest for a very long time. Uh, but th that's gone very rapidly because I think underlying it, for all the things we said earlier on, the two parties are more unpopular with the bulk of the general public than they've been in my lifetime. And people grudgingly vote for them. There's probably about 20% of the population that is fairly devotedly, tribally conservative, and about 20% of the population, or even less, which is devotedly and tribally <coughs> Labour. But by and large, of course particularly now, because of what's happened over Brexit, a substantial part of the public dislike both parties. And instead of having 
no eligible small parties, which was the case in 2017, we have an absolute plethora of them uh, uh, emerging. There are people are founding them by the day. Uh, and there is likely to be considerable support for them, particularly if we lay on opportunities like the European elections, if they take place, because the European elections have been taken, never been taken seriously by the British public, and always taken as an opportunity for protest voting, unfortunately, ever since we've been in the European Union. So uh, now that, so that I, that's my analysis, and I sound so it's yours as well. Um, this will make our political system very, very unstable because we plainly have no tradition of coalition forming. As I've said, our normal political skills of compromise and concession and holding broad coalitions together within the parties appear to have collapsed. People get ever more ardently members more of their small faction than their larger party. And uh, we've got, I mean, spiral's got to stop, because if we have at uh, eventually some general election, a, a multi-party confused outturn, with the result distorted by our first past the post system giving older results and regional results, uh, we, we could have an ever increasing problem of government having difficulty in functioning and the, the public getting ever more alarmed. Uh, I could get even more doom laden. I think we're very wide open to the kind of real extreme populist movement that swept through other people. If we had a, a really articulate, charismatic man or woman with extreme right-wing opinions or extreme left-wing opinions, doesn't matter which, who was able to conjure up with a few simple solutions the mood of national frustration, they can really sweep through. And our first past the post system is usually a defense about small single against small single issue parties. If you get enough votes, it actually helps them. If you only get 25%, as Roy Jenkins did, you're doomed and you're unrepresented, particularly if you're spread across the country. If you get 35% and you're <coughs> strong in some areas, you sweep on. As the Scottish National Party, which started as a protest party in modern politics, discovered in the first Scottish Assembly elections, uh, when they took practically every seat bar two. If you reach breakthrough, suddenly you wipe out the big old parties. And as we've seen in France, they're extinct, the old parties. That's not impossible in the British situation in the next 10, 20 years. Yeah, just two, two very brief points. I think, as, uh, as Ken Clark has Explain the, the, the our electoral system is highly non-linear, so there's a huge difference between 25% not getting many seats and 35% getting a whole heap. Um, but there are two problems with getting that reformed when you've got fragmented politics. The first is it's proved, and the Lib Dems very much know this um, to their cost, very difficult to persuade voters. Uh, about the impact of the electoral system and to persuade them that there's a legitimacy issue there. Uh, I mean, not just here, incidentally, when you look at America, you're not seeing many calls for reforms to the electoral college, even though the electoral college is the reason Donald Trump won, despite losing by several million votes. So people seem to find it very hard to understand or attribute responsibility to the electoral system itself, which makes reform very hard. And the second problem is the age-old problem of turkeys don't vote for Christmas, exactly. which is that... Who, who, you're always going to have to get reform passed by the people who just won under the existing system. And oddly enough, parties that are quite ardently in favour of reform to the electoral system seem to lose that passion the moment they've won a majority in the House of Commons under the electoral system. This is a point that Bernard makes in his book on Brexit in the UK. He said, we need electoral reform, but in order to get it, you've got to get too many parties to agree to it. So you're in a kind of loop, unbreakable loop. Yeah, Labour became quite keen on PR in the early 90s. They were rather less keen once they had a massive majority. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there was another question, I think, over there as well. Somebody... Well, kind of, my first question has been 
think there's a, quite a good chance that these uh, elections, if they happen, will end up getting taken, uh, treated by most voters as a kind of shadow second referendum. And I think that dynamic will make them a bit different to earlier elections because I think that there will be mobilisation on the pro-EU side that hasn't really happened in that kind of coherent way before. Um, that both sides, the, you know, as, as Ken Clark said, and he's quite right, British voters don't take these things very seriously, but there's kind of an obvious argument underneath the European Parliament argument, which is that really it's going to be a proxy for Brexit and your views about Brexit. With regard to UKIP, I think the interesting thing is that it looks like a rerun of 2009. In 2009, you had a far-right, very nationalist, openly intolerant party, uh, and then you had UKIP placing themselves between that far-right party and the Conservative Party, and looking to take both votes from both ends. Voters concerned about immigration, but put off by the BMP, and voters concerned about Europe and wanting to send a message to their traditional Conservative electorate. And Farage's Brexit party in 2019 looks very like UKIP in 2009. His old UKIP gang are now drifting off in a very BMP direction, very openly Islamophobic, Tommy Robinson and everything. But that dynamic of if you're not happy with the Conservatives' position on Europe because you're Eurosceptic, then vote for us. If you're not happy with immigration but you don't want to vote for bigots, then vote for us. That double dynamic applies now much as it did before. And I thought it was very interesting at the launch that he did that the word immigration wasn't mentioned at all. Uh, and I think you'd have to go back a long way in UKIP history to find the UKIP leader not mentioning immigration. Uh, so he's clearly pitching it as a Brexit election and looking to play both sides much as he did 10 years ago. Anybody else with a question? Yes. Do you need the microphone? Or do you I don't project, need the microphone. Project. I wish people would always use microphones for accessibility reasons. <laughs> um, I'm Penny Andrews, University of Sheffield. Uh, not really in the politics department, but politics is what I do now. Um, my question is about what we do to fix it, because not Brexit, because that's a very big problem, but in terms of the fractured country that we've got now, our relationship with the E27, our relationship with each other, because we're just shouting at the moment, and I would say both sides are doing that. Remainer is, Remainer is horrible about leaders, leave our about Remain, but them and that stuff that Rob was talking about, and then the way that we talk to the EU has been terrible. So what are we going to do to mend those relationships? What will it take? That's what I said. I've never heard anybody give us their satisfactory answer to them. We're all very strong on analysis and gazing at a more impenetrable future than I have ever seen in my lifetime. And I've not heard anybody give a convincing answer to the question, so I quite like to listen to anybody else. So, uh, <laughs> uh, they begin to give one. I, in the short term, I see more mayhem. I, I don't see any alternative to that. But I, I do have a certain underlying confidence in British society. There is still a, a great bulk of our population who are sensible, normal, you know, quite sophisticated people who will not want to carry on with this angry <laughs> protest voting forever. But I, haven't seen the, the figure emerging who's capable of mobilizing uh, some part of the center ground and uh, giving it expression. The, the independent group are having to go, but they're frightfully amateur in what they've done so far. And, 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 and uh, the, 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 the style of politics has not emerged, which captures the present very, very, very divided population and takes them back to slightly more sensible mainstream politics with a bit of Compromise could have given take. How do you repair national psychosis? Okay, Roland, well, 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 say something. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, also Penny Andrews' uh, question. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more with Kit Clark here. Um, you know, when, when, when Michael, at the very, very beginning, in the opening, quoted Michael Ender, you know, the never ending story, mm -hmm. and, and how this young hero, a trade uh, in, 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 the, in the magic uh, universe, fights the great lords. Um, <laughs> At that moment, everyone in this room knew that the Grey Lords obviously must be Jacob Rees-Mogg and Nigel Farage and those evil people. But from their perspective, the Grey Lords are somewhere in the, cor in the neon lit corridors of Brussels, <laughs> or among the Whitehall Mandarins, for that matter. Um, 
you know, so could we stop labeling each other? Now, with all due respect, Michael, I mean, that was a beautiful reference to, to literature, but could we stop considering each other gray lords here? So I think there are um, some interesting conversations. One of the comments about the extension we now have is that it's the worst of all worlds extensions because we've got six months more sort of uncertainty of blight. We discover that it's yet another critical time in the run-up to Christmas uh, and you can't buy the warehousing facilities that everybody was buying for a, a March exit, so it's incredibly inconvenient. It's not long enough to do as lots of the sort of big reconsiderations, but there has been some quite interesting work, I think, done by UCM, looking at what happens if you actually present people with the potential different ways out and actually get people to have a sort of relatively honest conversation about what the choices are. And I think one of the things that's really characterized all the politics of the Brexit debate is that everybody has refused, and the Prime Minister has led from the top on this, I think, to acknowledge the difficult choices that Brexit means. And actually you only get back by having a thing saying, you actually can't have it all, you can't have exact same benefits and total control. These are choices that you have to be making. And what I thought the UCL work did, the work Alan Rennick and the people on, on you know, getting people together, and actually spoke the choices, actually people come out possibly not a million miles away from the common market 2.0 and stuff like that. If you offer people those choices, whether they like them in the long run is a different matter. I think, you know, for some of the reasons Ronald set out, I think they are quite problematic for the UK. But I think it's quite interesting to say, can we actually start having a better quality of conversation where people actually acknowledge that there's sort of elements of right on everybody's side and we need to have a proper conversation about that and make some choices rather than just uh, talk past each other, which is what we've been doing in the last... Uh, last few years. And that's one reason why I think the process has been really bad on policy making. The government here has made policy by speeches, it's not made policy. Imagine what would have happened if in 2016 the Prime Minister's first act had been to put out a sort of discussion document about the choices now facing the UK, some of the problems, da -da -da. somebody might have pointed out to her that the uh, border in Ireland was going to be a bit of a problem, things like that, before you had that party conference speech setting out the red lines. So I think that would have set us up in a very, very different dynamic uh, of conversations. So I think maybe it's too late to get there, but I think that's where we need to get to. I think and also that is facing difficult choices. And I sometimes wonder whether the discussion we have in Northern Ireland has moved on to those difficult choices because we have the backstop there. We've had to really confront some really difficult issues. Now, there's still big gaps between unions and nationalists in particular. But at the same time, there is a sort of a new middle ground of individuals who have been engaging with the work. Oh, it would have worked better. I mean, it's from the word go. Uh, her political apparatchiks uh, just, just thought that she had to be in control. And it, you know, it did start with a startling assertion that there was, Parliament played no role yes. in exercising Article 50 and the invocation of the royal prerogative in a more astonishing way than anybody had ever tried to invoke it since 1688. Uh, and it's gone on from there. You did say she was a bloody difficult woman. Uh, yeah, she is. Just, <laughs> and, 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 and some of the, I, I just think that the, the number 10 apparatchiks and her just very rapidly got into a simple, straightforward approach. And as you say, far from having frequent political votes, they've had to be defeated in order to establish principles like they can't ratify treaties without having got parliamentary approval first. They're now lumbered with this stupid argument about meaningful votes. They're all meaningful, they used to be until two years ago. Uh, and uh, they, whilst this has gone on, the political parties have got ever more warlike, divided, fractured, everything else. Factions have emerged who won't compromise. So by the time you come back with your big question, only for the third time so far, uh, you find it's getting ever more difficult to make any progress. But that's enough of my complaining. It's always a mistake in life to try and solve a big problem by saying what might have happened if it had been tackled a different way. But we've got to make sure it doesn't damage the system permanently. Uh, because all kinds of new conventions are springing up. The one that troubles me most 
is the idea that government doesn't have to, to be bound by motions passed by the House of Commons. They're merely expressions of opinion. Uh, unless it's legislation changing the law, it's something for the government to take note of, which is now regarded as a ancient principle of our constitution and dates back about two years, I think. Uh, the idea that any previous parliament, the government should clearly, cheerily pursue policies for which a majority of the parliament had voted against it, or pursue a policy for which it had never obtained majority support, regardless as outrageous and ridiculous. So it does get asserted, which could get dangerous if the public's current preference for the emergence of a a strong man who ignores the rules is bought out at some future election because we, this particular parliament is fairly pathetic and is quite the weakest at exercising its powers of any that I've ever served in. Well, thank you for your questions uh, and thank you all the participants for their contributions. Can we just show our customary appreciation?